You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Rish Outfield. Where are the Cheetos? And Big Anklevich. Where's the Mountain Dew? Good morning. Is it morning? Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 2, number 4, page 91. I am Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. Announcer man, at your service. Announcer man. And the robot. Oh, wait, wait, never mind. The robot's not here. What, what, hey, what happened to our 8 of tea? He had some personal business that he had to tend to, and so he's, he's taken a, a leave of absence. Well, what kind of personal business could he have? I mean, he doesn't even have any genitals. <laughs> He's off for a few weeks anyways. He didn't elaborate. Uh, it was personal, I guess. Wait, to, but who's going to do all our technical stuff? Um, I don't want to have to do that. Yeah, that could be a disaster. Actually, we've got a replacement here. I, I called over to the temp agency, and uh, they sent us over a, uh, a temporary producer for the show. Announcer man, do you know anything about this? I, I don't I don't know. Who? There's nobody here. I, actually, look right there. What, that? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. It's another robot. Right. Oh, geez. Well, okay. Tell the robot hello for me. Uh, introduce yourself. I am C-Y-A-0-R-T. Whoa. It, it can talk? Yeah. Dude, that, how come our T couldn't talk? Wasn't part of his programming. I, I, I don't know. I'm not the robot designer. I just, you know. Okay. Well, hey, welcome to the show, C-Y... What did you call it? C-Y-8-0-R-G, I think. Was, Ooh, I, that's just, a mouthful. Just call him 80 R G. Hello, ADRG. I'm I'm Rish. I know your name, Rish Outfield. I am a big fan. Seriously? Yes. A fan of the show? Fan of the show, but even more a fan of you. Oh, hey, I like this guy. Yeah. Well, well thank you. I, I look forward to many, many weeks of uh, getting to know you, getting to know all about you, getting to like you, and getting to hope that you like me. Ha ha ha. Did you like that? I enjoyed that reference. Oh. That's funny because there's somebody in this room that doesn't uh, particularly like it when we sing. I thought yeah. the all singing um, episode was last week. <laughs> well, thank you. Welcome to the show, like I said. And uh, you're a fan of Big as well, I would assume. Somewhat. Well, that's, that's all right. He's an acquired taste. Um, <laughs> well, this is so cool to have uh, another voice on the show. To find somebody that admits to being a fan of you. That's really something. Yeah, a fan of us, I think you mean. How, how long have you been listening to the show? Uh, what, what, again? 80 RG. 80? 80, yes. Number 80 is 80? in the number. And then R G as in the letters. Oh, yeah, I gotta write that down. How long have you been a fan of us? I have listened since episode three, like everyone else. Yeah, that's weird. People really dig Raising Archie. Did you like the Michael Stone story we did uh, a couple weeks ago? I love Michael Stone. Oh, well, hey, you and I have something in common, I guess, other than our unpleasant face. Of all the episodes we've ever done, is there one that, that you feel is like your favorite or something hey, that you... Rish, uh, we actually have an episode to do today that we need to move along and get into. Okay, well, just, are, are you going to be with us uh, more than one week, uh, Edo GTS? <laughs> so, I'm sorry, what is, tell me exactly what your name is. I am C-Y-A-0-R-T. C-Y... You may call me A-E-R-T for short. That's that's really short. ADRG, I w look forward to many weeks of chatting with you. I, I looks like we need to start our story. What is our story this week? Then? This week's story is I Gotta Be You by Peter E. Abrish. Hmm. I Gotta Be You is an original story written by Peter E. Abrish. Pronounced R. Brush, apparently. Uh, sorry. The author of Easy Reading, Writing, and Eight Published Fiction Novels the latest of which is The Faltys Malcolm, a parody of The Maltese Falcon. Links to all his books may be found on his website, www.sidewalkbooks.com. Special thanks to Nicole Suddeth, Julie Hoverson, and Christine Maya Flares for lending their voices to today's episode. Today's music is by Ema. Check out the links in the show notes. I Gotta Be You by Peter E. Abrish. I awoke 
to find out I was already awake. Like listening to a radio with the background of your mind. Subliminal noise until a familiar tune reaches out to snatch your attention. I was attentive. But the familiar tune was unfamiliar. I felt no pain. Was I dead? But no, my throat was parched. I could not swallow nor open my eyes. My lips refused to part. Was I now a paraplegic? An odor invaded my attentiveness, triggering a memory of the interior of a hospital. Which made sense. I was dying after all. Except now I wasn't. How did I know that? Like knowing when you no longer have a headache. Somewhere in the inattentiveness, it had slunk off. When had death slunk off? Or had I already croaked? Maybe the other side of dying took place in undoing the things leading up to the divide. Did I now have to throw off the effects of dying? Lose the pain? Restart the brain? Convulse the heart? Pump the blood? Regain control of the body? Take up my palate and walk? I awoke again. This time I was aware of awakening, so I must have conked out mid-thought, which I couldn't remember. A perfume smell of flowers and herbs overpowered the smell of the hospital. The touch of a soft hand grasped in mine, a finger moving to my wrist and holding there. I tried my eyes again, prying them open, and a shaft of light stabbed me in the brain before my irises closed down and eased the pain. I could see odd shapes and colors, the rough outline of a figure standing next to me. Where am I? The thought clear in my head, but the words gobbled and ran together into nothing recognizable by the time they reached my mouth. Where am I? The figure hesitated, moved in close, featureless, as if a visitation from an ethereal being. I woke up again. The roar of a jet somewhere in the distance triggered a memory of flying somewhere. Single, high-backed swivel seats on either side of an aisle, facing fore and aft with small tables between. Old-time biplanes and dirigibles graced the bulkheads. The aroma of another flower, an herbal perfume as a woman in a blue uniform placed a Coke and a bowl of peanuts before me. I drank half the soda in one gulp, cold upon my tongue, a sweet bite to my taste buds. Take it easy with the Coke, Sebastian, said another woman. Across a small table from me, early thirties, wide blue eyes. We don't need you spiked on sugar. A man in his forties sat across from her. Round face, black hair with flecks of gray, dark brown eyes fixed on me. Both held stemmed glasses that shined ruby red in sunlight streaming through side windows. The memory carried the detail of total recall. Except it wasn't my memory. Never been on a private jet. Never saw that couple and didn't know a Sebastian who could down half a Coke in one gulp. Nor one who couldn't. I scrounged around for a flying memory of my own, but when I found one, it was a Picasso scramble of shapes and colors. So where did the Sebastian recollection come from? It took a while to answer that. I was not only dead, I had gone completely bug-fucky. I woke up again. Voices. Still garbled, but becoming clearer and more distinct. Making out words now. Someone young. Had to match. Available. I woke again, jerked awake by something tugging on my penis, and snapped open my eyes to see a figure standing beside my bed. Sorry, honey. Came a woman's husky voice. Words clear in my ears now. I'm just changing your catheter bag. No, I don't want it. Take it out. The words clear in my head but degenerated down the pathway to my mouth and slipping past my lips as, Don't want, don't want. What's that? Don't want, don't want. You don't want the catheter? Don't want, don't want. The figure straightened up, hands on her hips. You think you'll be able to make it to the bathroom on your own? I woke up again. Dark now. The woman gone. So was the catheter. Tight-fitting pants took its place. Like diapers? A shadow slipped across the ceiling of the somber room, cast by a reflective light from a car moving somewhere down below a window on my right. Sight clearer now, as if the pathway between my eyes and my brain had been clogged with wax which was slowly melting away. Same with the pathway to my ears. I tried out the nerve track to my mouth, but where am I came out as... Where am I? Where am I? Someone had propped me up on a pillow 
and I explored the surroundings with my new sight eyes. A hospital room, a door to a bathroom on the right, a half-open door to a hallway on the left, and opposite, a teenager stared back at me, disheveled curls of black hair, black eyebrows, pale blue eyes set in an oval face. A face I'd seen before, in the rearview mirror from the back seat of a car, while up front sat the couple from the private jet. Sebastian? The woman said. Put on your seatbelt. Sebastian paid her no mind, concentrated as he was on a string of snot dangling from one nostril, calculating how long it would take before gravity overcame surface tension and it parted company. Sebastian, the woman said again, put on your seatbelt and blow your nose. Not with the experiment reaching critical mass. The woman turned to the driver. (sighs) Would you speak to him? He's gone deaf to my voice. Seb, the man's face half turned, black hair speckled with gray. Put on your seatbelt. The snot let go and Seb caught it in a handkerchief. Okay, Dad. Okay, Dad? The face that had stared back at me in the car's rearview mirror was the same face that stared back at me from across the room. From a mirror across the room. You'll have to forgive me, I mentally said to the face. I don't seem to be myself today. I woke up again. Son of a bitch, I couldn't keep from falling asleep. Morning light streamed through the window this time, and a blonde woman stood at the foot of my bed. Mid-forties, lips set, head bent to a clipboard in her hand. Who the hell pulled out the catheter? Don't want, I said. Don't want. It don't make any difference what you want. You're supposed to... Her face shot up to mine. Eyebrows arched, jaw slackened. Mother of God, you're awake! She dropped the clipboard and rushed from the room. Mother of God, he's awake! Well, that should get some attention. Maybe now I could get some answers. That is, if I could frame a question. Like if I was now awake, how long had I been asleep? I woke up. Again. The hospital room, more defined now, more wax melted from behind my eyeballs. Midday light from the window on the right. Same teenage boy with the black curly hair in the mirror opposite. Only now a man sat in a wheelchair on my left, his chin resting on his chest, which rose and fell in deep breathing. A plastic oxygen mask fitted over his nose. As if feeling my eyes upon him, the head lifted. Older now, thinner, hairy, thick salt-and-pepper hair reduced to disarrayed wisps on a bald scalp. But no doubt the same man who had been driving the car. Okay, Dad? Well, I must have said it out loud, for the face brightened, and he pulled the oxygen mask from his nose. Seb, you're awake. Sebastian. Okay, Dad. You remember me. Smile forming on his lips. Thank God, you've come back to me. How are you feeling? Okay, Dad. The problem was, I wasn't okay, and he wasn't my dad. The last time I had called anyone dad was over 30 years ago when my father had passed away. You've been out a long time. Okay, dad said and rolled the chair closer to the bed, taking my hand. Can I get you something to eat? Are you hungry? Am I hungry? That's a new thought. I don't know, I said, but it slipped out of my lips as, Don't know. That's all right. Take your time. He patted my hand. No rush. We got a lot to catch up on. How come my words were garbled except for okay dad, which got out okay? Where am I? I said. I tried again. Where am I? Wicker Memorial Hospital. We were all in an accident, Seb. A bad accident. I was driving, but I'm not sure what happened. Your... your mom... Tears welled up in his eyes and spilled over to run down his cheeks. Well, she's not here right now. I nodded. Not here right now, coupled with body language, meant never would be here. Which left me ambivalent since I had no idea who she was. Nor, for that matter, who OK Dad was. Nor, when you got right down to it, who I was. OK Dad put the plastic mask back to his nose and took a couple of breaths of oxygen. You do remember me, Seb. I nodded. His eyebrows raised. That's right. You called me Dad. Anything else? I stared into his eyes. Despair and hope slipped past each other, with desperation in the middle. 
I remember the plane, my mind said, and my mouth relayed. The plane, the plane. The plane? His jaw dropped for a moment. Then his expression cleared. Oh, on the way to St. Bart's. Mom was worried you were loading yourself up with sugar by drinking all those Cokes. I nodded, and he nodded as if my answer was enough to confirm who I was. <laughs> We've been through a lot, he said, voice shaking. Then he brightened as he patted me on the hand. But you're back with me again. It's a miracle, Seb. Have to thank Dr. Porter for that. Porter and money. He rolled his eyes. You don't want to know how much money. He let go of my hand and knees back in his seat. But the most important thing is you're back, Seb. You're back. I'm back? Where had I been? How had I got from my deathbed to someone else's hospital room, looking out of someone else's eyes and seeing someone else's father tell me it was good to have me back? Then I woke up again, which brought a new thought. Was I falling asleep from exhaustion? Or was my connection to the Sebastian brain short and in and out? And what if it stayed out? Okay, Dad was gone. But a muscular man in a white medical coat stood beside the bed. We're going to get you up now that you're awake. Start you walking. Build your muscles. Get you eating. Then we can take out all the needles and let you go home. Go home? My home? Who would recognize me? It gave a whole new meaning to the Thomas Wolfe quote that you can't go home again. He wrapped an arm around my waist. Ready to try? Turned out not to be a question. He plopped me on my feet, pulling the blood from my head and sending dots dancing before my eyeballs. Then he twisted me to one side, sending a leg flopping out ahead, and to the other side and sending the other leg flopping out, and in the same manner flopped me across the room and back. He propped me up in a sitting position against a stack of pillows. Good job. You'll be dancing in the aisles before you know it. That's great, old joke, because I could never dance before. A heavy set woman brought in a food tray. Got something for you to eat, honey. Hungry? I shook my head. She set the tray on a bedside table and rolled it in front of me. Why do they keep asking questions if they don't want answers? But when she lifted the cover off a bowl of chicken broth, I changed my mind. An aroma filled my nostrils like nothing I had ever experienced. Or like nothing I could remember. Perhaps it was the difference between my old nose slowly losing its smeller and this young one savoring even the top notes. Whatever, it set my mouth watering and I ate every damn bit of it, tasting superb on my unsullied taste buds. So, there were compensations to balance the complications. And it turned out the therapist had been right about walking on my own. A few days later, moving from handhold to handhold, I went to the bathroom. But I had to crap out of someone else's asshole and pee out of someone else's penis, which looked more than adequate for its responsibilities. And I was glad to see I had one. Without it, I would have been in a whole nother ball game. Speaking of games, OK Dad visited me every day. He was like a psychiatrist, probing my memory by bringing up a family recollection, then sliding it over to me. If I was his son, I should remember something, right? So why not just blurt out the truth? No, I'm not your son. I'm just trapped in his body, and I don't know how I got here. Except there was a strong resemblance between his face and the one I saw in the mirror, with one major difference. Each day, the mirror took on a more healthy color, while OK Dad's paled and thinned. And there was a desperation in his voice that reminded me of when I was dying, and sought assurances of love from my own sons. So I mined nuggets from Sebastian's memory and relayed them in my rapidly improving speech, Nuggets that sent tears rolling down the old man's cheeks. But I felt no such reservations when the surgeon finally showed up one morning as I sat in a chair finishing a breakfast of oatmeal and orange juice. He breezed in dressed in a blue lab coat, striped blue shirt, blue paisley tie, and the countenance of a god. Hello, Sebastian. Rooftop eyebrows adorned his well-fed face, along with green eyes and comb-over on male pattern baldness. He graced me with a smile of perfect white teeth. I just got back into town, but I've been hearing good reports about you. I'm Dr. Porter. You operated on my brain? That's right. You're our little miracle man. How are you feeling? I pushed the bull aside. Mind telling me how I got here? That took him aback. You and your father were brought here after the accident. 
You heard about that? A, a drunken driver coming down the wrong side of the road? He leaned his backside on the broad windowsill and folded his arms. You were unconscious when you arrived, and five days later, when you hadn't come around, I was called in. Have you heard any of this? I shook my head. Okay. Well, we tried a few things, including just seeing if you would come out of it on your own. But we found some brain damage that was not going to heal itself, and after a month, your father wanted us to try a, a radical new procedure. One that cost in the millions? I asked, liberally interpreting what OK Dad had told me. He stared at me for a few moments, then finally nodded. In the millions? I blurted out, not really believing it. How many millions? There were a lot of elements involved. Uh, you wouldn't understand. Indulge me. Indulge you? Wow, big words. He gave half a shake of his head. All right. In a nutshell, we replaced a damaged part of your brain with a transplant and used some nifty new nanotechnology to link everything together. A highly skilled procedure, if I do say so myself. Fantastic procedure. He nodded. Still, it took a couple of months for you to come around. Yet, in spite of long odds, here you are. He smiled his perfect tooth smile again and held out both hands as if presenting me to me. You're not only awake, but walking and talking. Who was the transplant? He shrugged. An anonymous organ donor. Not important. Well, yes, it is. The rooftop eyebrows raised. When you transplanted that piece of brain, you transplanted me. He stared at me again, his jaw dropping before he recovered and shook his head. Nah, you're imagining things, Sebastian. I already talked to your father. He said you two shared past memories. Sebastian's memories with all the details, like Total Recall, including the things we normally filter out as unimportant. But they are not my memories. They invoke no feelings within me. Talk about a split personality. He kept shaking his head, but some of the assurance had ebbed from his eyes. Maybe that's what you're suffering. Look up the donor's name. It's Kevin Santani. Now how would I know that? You could have heard someone mention it, maybe when you were unconscious. I'm Kevin Santani, and I live in... I tried to bring it in, but it wouldn't come, only residuals that nibbled at the edges. I lived somewhere near the water. Now I'm Sebastian somebody, and I live in a hospital. I was a senior citizen then. Now I'm... How old am I? Fourteen. Fourteen? I watched him nod. Why didn't you get a transplant closer to his age? It wasn't that easy. First, we needed to match the blood and the tissue type, DNA, and the young people we found in that bracket were already brain dead. We couldn't use them. We faced enough odds without taking the chance of introducing the same problem we were trying to solve. What about me? What about you? Well, you said you couldn't use someone who was brain dead. He stared back at me, lips pressed together, and I could see it in his eyes. You didn't wait for me to die, did you? Look, Sebastian, you're imagining... You didn't wait for me to die, did you? I had nothing to do with that part of it. Was that the reason it cost so much money? We had no way of knowing how the trauma of death would alter the equation. As I said, we had enough problems. To tell you the truth, I had real ethical issues with trying this on a young person, even a brain-dead one. We chose the transplant donor we did because there was no way he was coming back. At most, he had only a few hours. So actually, you could say we did him a favor. The rooftop eyebrows arched and his lips turned down. Actually, if what you say is true, you could say we saved your life. I took a deep breath and let it out. More like you stole my soul. I was ready to die, had already accepted it, made peace with it. Now I'm left without family and friends and a past that belongs to someone else. I have access to almost none of my own memories. When something triggers one, a smell or, or a stray thought, it's like I'm hardwired to nowhere. You know, a computer with a screwed up hard drive. A, a digital picture pops up with pixels so skewed it's garbled into modern art. Colors and shapes melding into one another. And the remembered sounds and scents are out of whack, a flower smelling like an outhouse, a woman singing sounding like the scraping of fingernails across a slate blackboard. Without my own history, who am I? You're Sebastian Peter Stuyvesant, named after your paternal grandfather. Your father's name is Paul. Your mother's name was Allison. You know she died in the uh, accident. 
and I guessed as much. What about him? Is he as frail as he seems? Your father's cancer had metastasized even before the accident. I suspect he will not make it to year's end. So, is it any wonder he was determined to do whatever it took, spend whatever it cost to bring you back one way or another? It's not only his fortune, you're the sole heir to a two-century-old name. I stared at him. You're telling me I'm a walking sperm machine? I'm telling you it wouldn't have happened without the money. He pressed his lips together again. You know, you can tell him all this, or you can let him hang on to his dream for the short time he has left. So now you believe me when I tell you I'm Kevin Santani? He shrugged, shoulders, eyebrows, and lips. We don't know enough about the brain to know where our identity lies. The place where we exist, where we are who we are. He rubbed his hand across his chin. Can I ask you a few questions? I shook my head. I'm finished talking to you, but I, I will tell you this. I'm going to spend some of that fortune you mentioned to hire detectives to track down whoever cut my life short. Then I'm going to link them back to you. And if I ever hear of you trying something like this again, ever hear of you trying to publish this procedure or, or whatever you call it, I'll present it all to the police and spend some more fortune to see that you are prosecuted. Three days later, I left the hospital. I had an emotional farewell with OK Dad, who was supposed to go with me, but at the last minute had become so weak his doctors insisted he stay and receive a blood transfusion. I was ushered out of the building in a wheelchair as part of staff policy. I could have walked. My legs were strengthening every day. I intended to keep up with therapy and maybe start running in a few weeks. If I was going to inhabit this body, I wanted it to be mobile. A black Lincoln limousine waited for me at the curb. A man in a suit and tie held the door. Good morning, Sebastian. It took a minute before I was able to link face the name. Good morning, George. Not quite there. Good morning, Mr. George. Your father's not going with us? They want to keep him another day or two. Very well. I got in. He closed the door, walked around, and took his seat behind the wheel. A glass panel separating us, and we started out. I recognized nothing as we moved through traffic. But as we rolled along, images started forming in my mind before we came upon the reality, so that by the time we reached rural roads with fields of dandelions and setback estates, I was ready when we pulled into the gated drive of a French-style chateau. A ruddy-faced man waited at the entrance, wheelchair in hand, name of... Mr. Carstairs. Yes, he and his wife were in charge of the domestic chores. I'm sorry to hear your father isn't with you, Sebastian. May I help you inside? I'd rather walk. I looked around as I lumbered across a paved porch. Evergreen shrubbery hugged the stone building, oaks big enough to have been there when Columbus landed, a manicured lawn the size of a baseball field. My legs turned rubbery by the time I reached the massive double-door entrance. Taking the wheelchair might not have been a bad idea. I stepped into a two-story foyer with hardwood floors and walls, Twin staircases, black walnut treads, spindles, and banisters curved around on either side to meet at a large stained glass window on the second floor. There was no way I'd be able to climb them any time soon, but I knew an elevator lived down the hall on the left. May I help you up to your room, Sebastian? Mr. Costas asked. I looked for a place to sit down and saw an open door to a room on the right. I think I'll go in there, I said, pointing to the room, into the... Into the library. Very well. May I bring you something? A Coke, perhaps? I looked at the ruddy-faced Mr. Costas. A cup of coffee would be great. A little flicker of his eyebrow told me that wasn't what he had been expecting. I'd have to watch things like that. Wouldn't be ordering a beer any time soon. <laughs> but I had gone this far with the coffee and decided to hang in. Coffee with double cream would really be great. Very well. I wobbled into a high-ceilinged... Edwardian library, with walls lined with books and framed oil paintings, leather armchairs and couches scattered about on a thick oriental rug, a rolling cot contained cut glass decanters and tumblers, a Steinway grand piano commanded space in the rear corner. It came to me that ornate room had hosted many intimate gatherings in the past. Now it contained only one old man, disguised as a fourteen-year-old boy. I glanced back to the piano. Did Sebastian play? There was so much I didn't know, and uh, no one to ask. What happens when OK Dad comes home and asks me to play? What happens if OK Dad 
does not come home. I sat down at the piano, opened the top, and stared at the alien keyboard. But my hands reached out of their own volition, and my fingers remembered the keys, and notes came tumbling out of memory. Music filled the chamber, and after some minutes, I recognized the snatch of an old Sinatra song, paraphrased it, and sang along. I gotta be you. I gotta be you. I gotta be you. I'd rather be me, but I gotta be you. Author's Note Hi, this is Peter Arbrich, author of I Gotta Be You. The genesis of this story came to me as I was watching an interview on Charlie Rose. They were talking about the brain and what kinds of thinking took place in which of its lobes. And someone made the statement that no one knows just where in the gray matter the actual individual, that which identifies me as me, resides. So the next thought was, with all the body part transplants we have today, one of my sons has had two kidney transplants and a pancreas, it's not too much of a jump to suppose somewhere in the near future we'll be able to transplant a section of the brain to someone with a damaged lobe or two. But suppose the section that is transplanted is that which is the person's identity. And because, if it were me, I would want to trade up in life rather than end up destitute in Duluth, I decided it would take a lot of money to get someone to perform the experimental operation, and thus the new occupant of the body had to be rich. And of the same sex, of course, for otherwise it would have been a whole nother ball game. And speaking about transplants, please consider signing up as an organ donor. Don't take your organs to heaven when heaven knows they could live on and give life to someone here. Hope you enjoyed I Gotta Be You. Please check out my novels at www.sidewalkbooks.com. Thank you. So, Destitute in Duluth was the little scene <laughs> sequel to Sleepless in Seattle. <laughs> um, they had tried to get together, and, and that, that meddling kid had caused so many lawsuits and stuff with all the crap that he pulled in the first movie that Tom Hanks had lost all of his money. <laughs> and Meg Ryan was like, oh, crap, what am I saddled with? Uh -huh. uh, almost nobody saw it. It came out. It played for like three weeks in 2001. Right. Um, I think it was mostly just because Nora Ephron didn't sign on to that one. I mean, she's such a huge name that without her there, it just didn't carry the same weight. She was Ephron. off to do Hanging Up. Oh, we talked triumph. about that, didn't we? <laughs> Nora Ephron's sort of gone away. What was the last movie she did? Uh, hey, uh... <laughs> ADRG. A ADRG. Let's see uh, how your robot brain works. Uh, here's a little bit of trivia for you. What was the last Nora Ephron movie that came out? Her most recent outing was 2009's Julia and Julia, in which she produced, wrote, and directed the film. Right, right, I'd forgotten that. You know what? I never saw Julia and Julia. Yeah, I... Was it good? Did you see it? I saw the film and loved it. Boy, do I love Amy Adams. Oh, really? That's, that's interesting. What, is it the red hair? What is it about uh, Amy Adams that you dig? Her bubbly personality and charm. All right. You know, I saw that, too. You did. I think we may have talked about this once. My wife rented this one time. Wait, wait, I know where you're going. She fell asleep. Yes, she did. She fell asleep very early on. I was sitting there suffering through this thing, and I looked down, and she's snoring, and I'm just like, well, okay, I'm done. And I turned it off. And then she had the gall to suggest, hey, we didn't get through this last night. Let's watch it tonight. And I was just like, no, you had your chance. You had your chance, Gorman. That's right. You're going to get me to sit down for that one time. And if you fall asleep through it, then it's, that's it. And so, yeah, that was my experience. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I never saw it. I, I should. I like Meryl Streep. See, that's who I thought you were going with. I love Meryl Streep as well. Oh, really? What a fabulous actor. Yeah, the best actress of our generation, they said, or the previous generation. <laughs> well, when, when were you born, put together, completed? Uh, when, when did you hit the market? What, what, what is the word for born, for machine, for... Are you alive, ADRG? I am the newest model. 
Oh, okay, like a woman, you're not supposed to ask her age. But if you're a fan of Nora Ephron, can I advise you to stay the away from Bewitched? The, oh, dude, the stuff that happened in the concentration camps is nothing. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, that, that, that's wrong. Don't uh, go there. I, you know, I would rather watch, like, famine footage or disaster footage of cleanup of, like, the bodies that are all bloated. Oh, wow. And, uh, Bewitched was a bad movie, sir. You, sir, are worse than oh, Hitler. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I was, I was just trying to give you a little friendly advice about that. But I love Nicole Kidman. She's so cute. Okay. All right. Well, I'm obviously a big fan of the ladies. I'm like, like you. Oh, oh. Oh. Oh, see what I did there? That is not appropriate humor. We are in an enlightened age, Dick Anklevich. Oh, sorry, yeah. Well, that is a good point. Sometimes we say things on the air that both of us end up regretting the, the lick your b line from the other day. <laughs> oh, you had to bring that up. It's time when I referred to female circumcision, you know, things like that. Uh, so, so, yeah, thank you. And if you just want to keep an ear out for something that we might need to uh, edit out. Uh, that could be helpful, yeah. I mean... Oh wait, OT doesn't even edit out the stuff we ask him to edit out, much less help us out when we say something we shouldn't have. Yeah, I oh wait, OT should be uh, recycled. How's that for political correctness? You may be correct. Oh wait, OT is an older model. I am the current model. All right. Yeah. So far, no complaints at all. Don't <laughs> don't don't worry. You're. Are new. you going somewhere with this, guys? Well, yeah, I guess. Uh, <laughs> Announcer man, I forgot you were even in the room. We were talking about I derailed. Mean, we, let's see, bewitched. Talking about Nora Ephron movies. I think we were going to talk about the story a little. Or story. We did talk about <laughs> destitute in Duluth. That's that was, what it was. That was Thank good you. times. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Now I thought it was Abrush. I think it's Abrush. Okay, the thing is, he sent us a an audio sample to do a voice months ago, and he had this interesting accent. Uh, I, I sort of had that in mind while I was doing the reading. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it, 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 actually hearing his voice in the author's note, it sounded nothing like the voice that I did. <laughs> but in my mind, uh -huh. that's how I had remembered the voice. Yeah, hopefully that's a good thing. That's, that's flattering. That's not insulting. Uh, there was some some interesting issues with that. You know, we assume that the boy doesn't have this accent that you gave the narrator. So as he becomes more the boy, you had to kind of drop that. And we even had ourselves a good time with that coffee line where he said, hey, I can have a cup of coffee. Not only asking for coffee, but the uh, accent itself perhaps makes the uh, manservant pause. Now, I, I don't know. Does the voice in my mind, sound like the voice that comes out of my vocal cords uh -huh. because it's just used to hearing that. And if, if you were in an accident and you damaged your vocal cords, would the voice that you speak with suddenly no longer sync up with the voice that you have in your yeah, brain? Yeah, would your old voice that you used to speak with when you had regular vocal cords, would that remain the voice of your thoughts inside your head, even though your new voice couldn't make that any... That's interesting. Yeah, yeah I see, I, I figured that it would. That yeah. you would have to have this new voice for a long time before you would make an adjustment. And so, in my mind, when he spoke aloud, once he'd recovered from the accident, he had to concentrate to say coffee instead of coffee. You know what I mean? It, it, he had to concentrate to sound like a normal kid. Sorry, like he had to concentrate. It's a rich kid instead of like himself. Thank you. And and I don't know if that came across. And it, it doesn't matter. It was never really touched upon in the story. Yeah, they that never was, said there was an accent. That was kind of our interpretation. I mean, he may have said his smeller or he, did he say croaked. Smeller. Some things that are a little more... Uh, typical of that accent but yeah we just kind of interpreted it that way i guess yeah and listening to his author's note yeah you know i think there are things that we can't know as far as how the brain works or, uh -huh. or, or as personality or the individual the soul of a person they will have to do partial brain transplants or brain reconstructions and all that and just find out what happens yeah we'll um, never know until we do it you know, if the movie regarding Henry where, with, with Harrison Ford, where he's a real hard ass lawyer and then he gets a head injury yeah, he gets shot, and suddenly he? he's kind and, you know, he becomes much more emotionally on the level of a child, but he recognizes what he used to be and he doesn't want to be that anymore. I don't know that there's any truth to that story. Maybe that's just wishful thinking, but it's possible that, you know, that, the, the, that you are who you are because of the way that your brain is. And if something happened to damage it or repair damage to it, that you would start to be someone else. Uh-huh. 
Although, I mean, that sounds like my Symantha, doesn't it? I mean, <laughs> all I'm saying is I, we don't know. Yeah, maybe this is the opposite of the my Symantha story. I mean, my Samantha. That's okay. It was misspelled in the story. Good point. Thank you. Yeah, that story was kind of the opposite of this one. I, I didn't even think about that until now. But yeah, that was where someone, it's like their body switched, but their brain was exactly the same. So she, she did everything the same. She acted the same, but suddenly she looked totally different. Whereas this one, the brain is taken from one person and put into another. So now he looks totally different, but his head is still the same. Wait, that's the same thing, isn't it? I'm going for a smoke break. This might be a different take on the same idea. As far as the Doug McIntyre story goes, we never really got any answers as to what had right. happened. And this one, there's definitely an explanation for it. Uh -huh. But well, something that really surprised me is that he was upset about having a life to live over again. You would think that an old person would give anything yeah, to, to be able, be able to, to do to start again. again. You know, I don't want to be buried in a pet cemetery. I don't want to live my life again. That was all for you, announcer man. <clears throat> no singing, please. But, but perhaps growing old and seeing the end approach puts you into a certain mindset of saying goodbye and getting your affairs in order and, and uh -huh. all that stuff. I mean, how many times have you seen in a movie or a TV show where somebody has an expiration date right. and then it turns out that that's a misdiagnosis or there's some miracle cure? And it's not that they're disappointed, but in a way it's just like, whoa. I'm not relieved. I don't know how to deal with this. I was ready to go. That seems like maybe that's human nature too, but I don't know. This guy was returned to being 14 years old. I mean, he's got to go through high school again. I mean, you remember the Top Secret movie where the guy's <laughs> being whipped by the Nazis and he falls asleep and dreams that he's back in high school. And he's like, no, this is terrible. And then he wakes up and he's like, oh, phew. I thought that was real. So, you know. Being tortured by Nazis is better than going back to high school. Maybe if he woke up as a 20-year-old, he wouldn't have been so upset. Yeah, uh, you, know, you and I have a friend in common, and every time that he would see a certain kind of movie, he would complain. Uh, have I said this on the air before? If I have, I apologize. But he would complain that the movie ended at the precise point he wanted <laughs> the story to begin. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you've said that on the air. Well, I'm saying it again because I think it totally applies to this story. What would it be like yeah. to suddenly have 50 or 60 more years and this time of wealth yeah. and privilege and most importantly, all of the life experience and knowledge and wisdom that comes with living your whole life? Now, granted, the main character couldn't remember certain things. Yeah, he, he had a hard time it. with his old memories. But from what we heard, as far as the narrator goes, he seemed pretty with it. He seemed yeah. to have all of his faculties with him. And you see that kind of a lot in movies, too, where they'll, they'll do those, uh, you get to go back to high school and do it all over, and how are you going to do it this time? From a movie like Never Been Kissed, where she just pretends to be younger than she is, to like the, what was that, Zac Efron one 13 going on 30 or was uh, that no that was again, no 17 again maybe 13 going on 30 was that jennifer garner one right we anyways about it on the air too. yeah we may have but yeah you know they get to go back and experience these high school moments over again but this time with a, a clearer head with the knowledge that you've gained through a lifetime and instead of totally blowing it like most people do as they go through their high school years. They get to do it right, and this guy has that chance too. So it's a nice way to go, I guess. Now, if you could go back to when you were in high school, would you read The Lord of the Rings? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. But I was having sex in high school. <laughs> Thank you. But see, and, and to me, there's always a great deal of romance and appeal to being able to go back, knowing all that stuff. You know, putting right the things that you screwed up, being brave when you were cowardly. Yeah. You know, turning left when you originally turned right, or in my case, just stood there. And uh, I would imagine that a thousand years from now, people will tell stories about that because human nature, while we may be evolving as a species, the, the, the whole point of uh, regret is to teach us lessons and all that stuff. I, yeah. There's, there can't be a single person. Who's never had any regrets. Uh, right. And uh, wanted to change them. Uh, in fact, uh, as far as this ending goes, I, I, I had trouble. I wanted to know what happened next. And this is, the, I guess, the second time that I've done that, where I, I asked the writer if he would give us more. Uh, the first time that we did this, it was on uh, 
with Mars in his hand. That by Posley Gravel. Yeah, thank you, O eight R G. I'm eighty. Eighty. See, I'm dude. I'm like your wife calling out another guy's name. Eight O R G. How dare you? Thank you. Yes, and on Mars in his hand, I asked the writer to give us just a little bit more, and he did. And in this case, Peter was kind enough to do the same. So he wrote a little coda scene after where the story ends. And, and But when we read it, it didn't satisfy. It was just like the beginning scene of a whole new story. Right. You know, yeah, what just... is he going to do in this new body? Write a sequel to it. But where your story ended originally, maybe that's where we'll end it again. And so I, I don't feel as bad as I did asking Bosley to rewrite uh, the ending that time because – we didn't end up using it, but I do appreciate that Peter humored me on this. He actually gave us a couple different choices, and they were good endings, but uh, in the end, I kind of liked the open possibilities. Kind of left you with that feeling of the future's so bright, he's got to wear shades. It's just wide open. And, Are you uh, guys singing again? And, you know, yeah. you can imagine what comes next, or maybe Peter will write another story and uh, tell us what comes next. But, uh, yeah, it was uh, it was... An interesting little tale. Yeah, it was good stuff. I I guess I've already talked about why I liked it. Now, this is ancient history. By the time we're recording this, by the time it hits the air, by the time it hits the, what is it, that word that you use? Podosphere? Oh, yeah, I love that word. I try and find it, a way to use it at least twice a day. You may need counseling. Sometimes it doesn't even really fit with what I'm talking about, but, I, it, you know, that's a potosphere. I, I think it's possible that someone out there can help you with Someone this. out there in the potosphere might be uh, able to. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so June saw the end of our Broken Mirror story event. Yes, that's deadline. right. It did. You entered. You wrote a story, right? I did write a story for it this time around. I figured I'd do that. But you wrote a story last time, too. I did write one last time around, too. How about that? Can I talk to Big Anklevich? I'm sorry. I didn't realize who I was talking to here. Um, when we recorded the whole thing and talked about it and all that, I had nothing for that story. And I just figured I probably would not have nothing. And I figured, you know, I wasn't ashamed to say that I wasn't even planning on really going for it. But uh, strangely, yeah, out of the blue, uh, as the month wore on, I just thought, you know, maybe I ought to just try and write it. And so... I sat down and pounded it out. I wrote it actually pretty quick, which is uh, unusual for me. And, and uh, yeah, that, that it worked out pretty well. And I managed to get it in in plenty of time. You know, I think last time, Broken Mirror Story, I finished my story about four weeks after the deadline had passed. Seriously? So, yeah. <laughs> and then I lied on the air and said that I'd got it in just in time. You bastard. So, uh, yeah, this time around, I actually uh, did it on time and... I don't know if it's better or worse than last year's story, but... I don't think it could be better. Last year's story was really, really good. I don't know that anybody ever complimented you on it besides me, but... Yeah, I thought it was really, really good. Well, thanks. Yeah, this year's sucked, so there's that. Well, good. You and I have something in common for once. <laughs> Wait, we both love Eddie Money, right? How could anybody like Eddie Money? He speaks to me. Uh, um, okay, so we have one thing in common, which yeah. is that both of us wrote Broken Mirror stories and uh, they weren't good. Is that fair <laughs> to say? Well, see, I haven't read that's yours. Fair so to you say. may be selling yourself short. So there's a lot well, of S's. That's possible, and but not likely. Do you have any idea how many entries there were this year? There was quite a few. I think we had like 14 or 15. Dang, I, that's so great. Yeah. Just the fact that people get behind this contest and get interested in it, it's, re it's really cool. And I guess we're going to do it like we did last year where we and other readers just read all of the entries and give them like a letter grade or a number and then all that's averaged out and a winner is is, is announced. Is that right? Or yeah, I think that's how we'll do it. But we'll probably do several of the entries as well as, as uh, like we did last year. I think we wound up doing five or six of them in the episode. No poems. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, I'm sure it'll probably be something similar to that because that's really the fun of the whole thing. I mean, the cool thing about the contest in the first place is that you get to hear different takes on the exact same premise. Everybody had the same starting point. It's like there was a race and they lined everybody up at the line and they shot the gun and everybody ran in different directions. But, yeah, it's neat to see 
the journey that they all took the uh, same idea on. So again, you know, we'll we'll put the stories on the uh, site for everybody to read, and they'll all get the chance to read like we did. And uh, yeah, some of those will also be made into episodes, I guess. I don't know how many we'll do. All depends on how ambitious we get, I guess. Well, speaking of ambition, we've sort of decided to not be in charge of the whole slush reading submission pile anymore. So that we can focus on producing the episode, making offensive comments, editing things and getting them up on time. Mm -hmm. So maybe now is a good time to make that announcement. Yeah, you may have heard of Sudden Death Nicole being mentioned before on the show, but uh, just recently, yeah, we we thought it would be a good idea to extend an invitation to her. And and so, yeah, Nicole, we have made our submissions editor at the Dune Steve. I I believe that's known as a battlefield promotion. And so, yeah, she's uh, she's the one that's in charge now of the slush pile, and she forwards uh, the stories that make it through onto us in the end for us to decide on whether we want to uh, say yay or nay on them. And and thanks to Nicole, I will never again have to read a submission. Right? Thank you. That's not true. Because eventually, if we're going to say yes on a story, you're going to have to read it. Oh, crap. But those should be the good ones. I've been hiding my illiteracy for all this time. (laughs) Now it's going to come out. But yeah, you'll never have to read that one dude again who says, My story is awesome. Here's the first 200 words of it. Send me an email when you want the rest. Because I haven't written it yet. (laughs) You're such a tool. (laughs) But uh, thank you, Nicole. I don't know that we've thanked her on the air. uh, But if we have, here's another one. You you deserve it. We need to thank her more anyway, so... She does really good things for us, and uh, if this episode, what you're listening to now, unless you turned it off already, got out on time, part of the thanks goes to Sudden Death Nicole. And if it did not, it's surely my fault, because I'm always the one that's the last one to finish. Could be Marcus's fault. Oh, why'd you have to bring poor Marcus into this? Sorry. And now, what is this? Hey, Rish. Hey, Paula. What the hell? Oh, it, it was a song from like 50 years ago. Which explains why you know it, I guess. Okay, I'm going to start again. Hey, Rish. Hey, Big. Guess what time it is. Time to sing the theme song. Time to ask for donations. We've already asked this week. No, we haven't. Well, I did it last week. You've never done it. Yes, there was this one time when you, you See, made... only one time. Well, one time last week. Okay, we'll flip for it. Why, like a coin? Yeah, we'll flip a coin. All right. Heads, what? You beg for donations, tails I beg? Other way around. So heads, you beg, tails I beg. No, the opposite of that. So tails I beg, heads you beg. No, if it lands on heads... You beg. No, you beg. If it lands on heads... You beg. No, you beg. That's what I said, you beg. Dude, listen, if it lands on heads, then you, Rish Outfield, have to beg. I don't want to beg. I know that's why we're flipping for it. And if it lands on tails? Then I beg. Dude, that's the opposite of what you just said. No, it isn't. It's the opposite of what you said. Well, it's the opposite of what somebody said. That's how opposites work, man. So if it lands on heads, you beg for donations. If it's tails, it's my turn. But now you're changing it up again. No, that's how it's always been. No, uh, when, when when I first proposed that we do this. Yeah, I first proposed it, man. Well, fine, fine. But when you first proposed we do this i suggested that if it landed on heads i have to beg but if it lands on tails you have to right okay then that's fine wait wait maybe i got it backwards doesn't matter let's just get on with this okay do you have a coin no do you no oh sorry folks we pay our authors and we have other costs as well that are associated with having a magazine that puts out stories and so forth. And so, you know, we really need your help. If you're so inclined, if you feel generous, if you enjoy the show, stop by our website. We've got little buttons on the website. You can just click on it and you can donate any sum you'd like. You could donate a gazillion dollars, you know, lots of money if you want, or little. You can sign up to subscribe to the show and donate five bucks a quarter or five bucks a month. You know, we really appreciate those folks because, hey, we know that that's always coming in and that really helps us to plan for what we're going to do. So, you know, if you're feeling generous, please. Oh, dude, I hate to interrupt you. I found a quarter. Oh, Oh, we don't need it, but thanks. All right. That brings us to the end of the show. It's about bloody time! 
Uh, so I guess that's uh, our show then for today, huh? Let's call that our show. Thank you, Peter, for sending the story, for jumping through the hoops on that one. I, I hope that you feel like the end result was worth it. Thank you for listening all the way to the end of the episode. Thank you if you have ever done a voice for us or edited for us or donated to the show. And, yeah. and if you haven't done one of those things, it's not too late. But yeah, thanks for providing us with some joys and some victories. Oh, th- thank you, CY, CY80RG, for helping us with the episode. Welcome to the family. Uh, you do realize it's a temp, right? Whatever I have to sign to get you here next week, <laughs> I am willing to do so. All right. I have been Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. Thanks for listening. Good night. Keep those cards and letters coming, folks. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you can share the Dune Steve with anyone you'd like, but you can't sell or change the files. Take two. Are you alive? L O G O T. Okay, maybe we should write it down. What is his, his name? His name is Logot. Apparently, I thought you were going to write it down. What the hell? I've got a pencil, but I don't know what to write it. Idiot. I've changed my mind. You're an idiot, Chris. Take me home tonight. I don't want to let you go till we see the light. I woke to find I was already awake. Like listening to a radio. Like a meshug in the radio with a background of your mind. Subliminal noise until a familiar tune reaches out to snatch your attention. Can you imagine doing a whole story in that voice? I could do it. But we would get so many death threats from the Prince of Persia and Guy Iokis. I don't want to let you go till you see the light. Scale from 1 to 10, how much do you like that song? Not very much. Sorry. But it's Eddie Money. Yeah. That, does that make does that influence you in it? Part of the reason why I'm not an Eddie Money fan. <laughs> What's the matter? You can't be intimate with me. Well, I, I wouldn't go that far. I just. What about <laughs> if I could walk on water? If I could find some. No, I'm saying it's Eddie Money. It hasn't changed. No, well, I'm choosing different Eddie Money songs That's to determine. I'm deter- saying you can choose all the. That's Eddie a really songs, good song. And they would all land in the same category. I woke again, jerked awake by something tugging on my penis, and snapped open my eyes to see a figure standing beside my bed. Sorry, honey, came a woman's husky voice. Words clear in my ears now. I'm just changing your catheter bag and giving you a hand job while I'm at it. I remember the plane, my mind said, and my mouth relayed, the plane, the the plane, the plane, the plane. What is it, fantasy boss? It's fantasy tattoo. Is that both of us are dead and in hell, doing this terrible show for eternity. A few days later, moving from handhold to handhold, I went to the bathroom. Ew. A few days later, sir. A few days later, moving from handhold to handhold, I went to the bathroom. No! Why must you fart? You're maybe the worst person I've ever met, sir. Oh, gosh. That stinks. Scared me, no way. I'm going to read the rest of the story through this shirt. <laughs> no, I'm not your son. I'm just trapped in his body, and I don't know how I got here. Hello, Sebastian. Let's get this guy. Okay, this is our, our mad scientist, right? Mm-hmm. Hello, Sebastian. <laughs> what do you think? I'm sorry to hear your father isn't with you, Sebastian. Do you like that? Or sure. I'm sorry to hear your father isn't with you, Sebastian. <laughs> May I help you inside? It's Chocula. Ooh, Barry. We'll do it in a uh, uh, Jim Henson voice. I'm sorry to hear your father isn't with you, Sebastian. Oh, oh does that sound like Doctor Evil? May I help you inside? It does sound kind of Doctor Evil. That would have been my guess. I'm sorry to hear your father isn't with you, Sebastian. <laughs> May I help you inside? I call him Mini-Me. 
the latest of which is The Faulty's Malcolm. Is that right, Malcolm? Yeah. A parody of The Faulty's... 